Thank you for joining me this evening on Wednesday, September the 9th. I'm glad to have this opportunity to study the Word with you. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Jude tonight. The book of Jude. And uh, most of all of you know, that's the next to the last book of the Bible. Uh, just before Revelation. And it's a general epistle that was written to all Christians uh, about the time of A.D. 65 to 80. And uh, somewhere in around in that area uh, of time, but uh, in the early church, early days of the church, and uh, so we're going to be looking at Jude tonight, and uh, the go through the entire book. It's only one chapter, uh, as you probably know that one of five books in the Bible that is only one chapter in length. Uh, but we're going to be uh, getting into there. So if you would like to uh, join me in a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for our time together and the opportunity we have to study your word together. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will illumine our hearts and our minds and illumine uh, the word uh, so that as we study it, we will understand it, how it applies to our lives and how we can live our lives more faithfully uh, for you. Pray, Lord, that you will search us afresh and anew if there's any unclean way in us, any sin that we have not confessed. Father, we just want to confess that to you now and ask for your forgiveness so that you may cleanse us from all unrighteousness and re remove anything that may that is hindering our fellowship, may hinder our time of worship as we study your word tonight. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you will use it for your glory. Pray that you'll help me to die to myself and simply share as your spirit leads through me. And we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the book of Jude is, is an interesting book, and uh, we're just going to dive right into it. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard, and uh, I think it best just to go ahead and read the entire book, then we'll go back and uh, kind of break it down in different sections and see what is taking place here. So again, reading from the New American Standard, uh, beginning here in the first verse of Jude. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe, and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and revile ange angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he dis disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feast, when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Clouds without water carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, 
wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, In the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So that is the book of Jude. It is a letter, a general epistle, that was sent out to all the Christians uh, in the early church, in the early time of, of Christianity. And it was sent around to the other churches uh, or all the churches that were around, and it was read much like that. It would simply be read to the church, and they would listen to that. Then they would probably go back and maybe study it, much like we are doing tonight. So what I want to do is kind of go just verse by verse and see what Jude is trying to say here, what, what is going on um, in this time and why he has written his letter. So the introduction here is in verses 1 and 2. We find out that he's a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Bondservant means he's a slave of Christ, that uh, he is owned by him. All of us Christians can claim that as well as we have surrendered our lives to him. We have willingly become bondservants with Jesus Christ. We are here to serve him. Bondservant of Christ and brother of James. Now, James was the leader of, of the church at Jerusalem. And of course, as you probably know too, James was the half-brother of Jesus. And so this makes Jude the half-brother of Jesus as well. So he has grown up with Jesus. And as we understand from Scripture, and uh, that his brothers didn't really believe who he was until after his death and his resurrection, but then became... Uh, vital parts of the early church and leaders in the early church. And so Jude here is the half-brother of Jesus. And he says, this is he's writing to those who are the called or the beloved in God the Father and the ones who are kept for Jesus Christ. These are Christians. So he's writing to his Christian brothers and sisters uh, his brothers and sisters in the faith. That's who he's writing. Now, and he, of course, just gives the nice uh, uh, salutation of may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you in verse 2. When we get to verse 3, we find the reason for his writing. Now, as we see there, he says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. He wanted to write some nice things about uh, the common uh, uh, blessings and the common uh, life that they have as Christian brothers and sisters. What, they, what are the good things about being saved? But because of circumstances, 
he had to write an encouraging letter for and encouraging them in the way to contend earnestly for the faith, meaning they needed to stand up and fight to keep Christianity and its teachings pure and right. Now, what has been preached to them and taught to them by the apostles has to remain pure and undefiled. It has to for Christianity to continue. In verse 4, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Why is he saying you're going to have to contend for the faith and make sure things are done correctly? Because we are finding out there are false teachers coming in trying to mess things up. Okay? Now, Peter wrote about the, these uh, false teachers coming in in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, just a few books ahead of Jude here. But it says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies and even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote about them in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. So he is saying these false teachers have come in teaching uh, false doctrine. And so that's why I'm having to write to you not just a nice letter about uh, and, and rejoicing in the salvation that we have, the liberty we have in Jesus. But now I have to tell you, remind you, you've got to contend for the faith. We are in a battle. And of course, in this time, Jude is talking to them then that they are in a battle, but he's also, this being the word of God, is speaking to us as well. We are in a battle. In verse 4, he says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Peter and Paul also said these, these guys are coming. They're ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So they're ordained to this condemnation, as we find out in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 11, those who are false prophets and their demise, what's going to happen to them. They are ungodly, meaning they are enemies of God. They are not saved. And these, again, they're not simply Christians that uh, are disagreeing or have different opinions. They actually, as it says in the end there, they deny Jesus. They deny him being God. They deny him being the Son of God. And they deny him being the Messiah. So therefore, they are non-believers. They are ungodly. And they, as it said in here, they turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. That's a big word. What does licentiousness mean? Well, there are kind of three um, uh, definitions that I've found. The first one is it means they are sexually immoral or offensive. Another thing is they are lacking legal and moral restraints, especially disregarding sexual restraints. Or it, they are marked by a disregard for strict rules of correctness. So basically, what they were doing here, where they were saying, you can do whatever you want to do. And in this case, too, a sexually uh, immorality, they were condoning those things uh, that maybe some of the other peoples of the other religions uh, that, that would follow and say that that's okay. And they would say, it's okay to do this, whatever you want to do, because God will forgive you because of his grace. His grace allows you to do whatever, and God will simply forgive. There are people these days uh, now that think, well, this is something I don't really need to do, but you know, God will forgive me, okay? Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess 
your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, yes, he will do that, but why do we want to do that to him? Paul speaks against this in Romans chapter 6. In verse 1 and 2, it starts out, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? So he is saying, look, we don't just sin to see more of God's grace. That's not how it works, okay? We have died to our sin. We are supposed to be repenting from that sin, turning away from it, and following God and his righteous ways. So that's not what we are supposed to do. As we get to verse 5, Jude is going to show the apostate past, okay? And he reminds his readers of God's judgment on the ungodly people in the Old Testament times, okay? Verse 5, I desire to remind you, you know all things uh, once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. God rescued the children of Israel out of, Is out of Egypt and their bondage there. Moses led them out, okay? But because of their unbelief that God's, God was able to use them to overtake the land of Canaan, which was their promised land, they did not believe that except for two, Joshua and Caleb, okay? They had to then suffer for 40 years, and all of that generation died, okay? So he's reminding them. You find that in Numbers chapter 14. In, in verse 6, then, he is reminding about the fallen angels, angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. God cast the angels who followed Lucifer uh, in his prideful act of, of claiming to be God or equal to be God. He cast them out of, of heaven. Okay, And then he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. Since they in the same way, their pride and saying we can do what we want to do. As these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Their willingness to defy God and live in immorality, God punished them and destroyed their cities and the cities around them. That whole valley, those people were destroyed because they were unwilling to follow God's ways. This is what Jude is reminding them. Remember, if you don't follow God's ways, this is what happens to you. And if you stand in defiance against God, this is what's going to happen to you. As we get to verses 8 through 16, he then comes into uh, the present, the present being when he wrote this to the early church Christians. He says in verse 8, Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. They're dreamers. These are false prophets who get their teachings by what they claim as revelation or dreams. Now in De Deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 1 through 5, you'll find the test that is to be used against someone who claims to be a prophet. And what they prophesy, if it comes true, then then that is there, then, then they are a true prophet. If it does not, it shows that they are not a true prophet and they are to be destroyed. Also, they don't claim that they are the ones that prophesied that, but it's simply a word from God. And they have to, we have to understand that. We, there are false teachers this day, a huge denomination, uh, or what would be claimed as a denomination of Christianity, which is really not, that, that a teenager got his, all the teachings of, of his faith from a dream that happened in his backyard. Okay, that's not what is supposed to be done. That's not according to God's word. In verse 9 it says, But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, 
did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. They wanted to uh, turn the Lord's grace into a reason for pride, lust, and immoral living. And they were contaminating and destroying the church with their evil doctrine and even acted as if they are greater and more powerful than Michael the archangel. And they feel that their own thinking is superior even though their teachings and their actions actually corrupt them, just like they did in Sodom and Gomorrah. And in verse 11 through 13, there's warnings of the apostates. And Jude warns them as to where they are headed. In verse 11, we come to where, where he says, Woe to them! All right, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now these three he gives as examples. Well, we know about Cain, okay? He refused to honor God, and he became the first murderer, okay? Balaam misled the people of Israel into idolatry, for his own profit. Coram led the rebellion against Moses and Aaron, who were God's chosen leaders. The false teachers were wanting to have all authority and were willing to destroy men's souls to get it and profit from it. That's what the false teachers were trying to do. In verse 12, these are the men who are hidden reefs. Here he begins to use examples from nature to teach their characteristics, who these men really are. They are hidden reefs um, in your love feasts when they feast with you. Hidden reefs are things that will sink a boat. Okay, They'll destroy uh, a craft on the water there. At love feasts, these are their fellowships. They're going to destroy the fellowship as well. They don't care who they hurt. Okay, clouds without water, carried along by the winds, clouds that don't supply water, water was needed for life. And so if they are a cloud there and they don't give the water that they need to give, they are giving a false hope. Trees, okay, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead uprooted. The trees should have provided food, okay, but they did not provide. And they're not only dead, but doubly dead. They're uprooted, meaning they're never able to produce. So these false teachers deprive the people of their basic necessities of life or for life. And basically, what he's saying is, well, they are robbing them of their spiritual needs. They are not feeding them spiritually because they are teaching false doctrines. He continues in verse 13, Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness uh, has been reserved forever. Waves, wild waves, they tear up. They sink boats. Wandering stars, uh, these are ones that cannot be used as a guidance for ships, such as the North Star at night. Okay, They're not able to guide, they're not able to lead, they're not able to help because they don't have the truth. In verse 14 and 15, when we get to this, now these verses quote the apocryphal book of Enoch. And it's a prophecy of the judgment upon these false teachers. It was also about these men, here verse 14, that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Verse 16, these are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. 
Verse 16 is just a final overview statement about these false teachers and their character. They speak arrogantly. Nobody likes someone who's arrogant. They flatter people for the sake of gaining an advantage. They're only trying to flatter just to get ahead. There's a lot of fake people out there that we know, that we see, that do these things, and we know not to take them for their word. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that are deceived by people such as this. And that's what Jude is saying. They're out there. They're, uh, these false teachers are there and trying to take advantage of other people. So as we come to verse 17 through 23, he's told us about the false teachers, the apostates, what they have done, okay, and what is going to come of them as well. But in, in verse 17, we find that he's saying you need to guard yourself. In verse 17, he says, But you, beloved, again, the beloved that word means Christian brother and sister, okay? You, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, remember and follow the teachings of the apostles. The apostle Paul, Peter, James, John, the others that were writing and ministering and leading in the churches, uh, the early church there. Okay, in verse 18, that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. They have all warned you about this. He reminds them that they've already been given these warnings, so they have to be watching out. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lusts. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, Paul writes, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Now notice this mocking of Christians and our faith, it's getting louder even here in the United States, is it not? Many of you know who are my age or older, we did not see the mocking of Christianity when we were younger, but it has slowly gotten worse and worse. It's stronger, it's more vocal, and notice the negativity against Christians and Christianity now compared to 10, 20, 30 years ago. The persecution of Christians is on the rise. We must be aware of that. Verse 19, again, talking about these mockers. These are the ones who cause divisions. They're worldly minded and devoid of the spirit. More characteristics just like verse 16, more characteristics of these ungodly men, these ungodly people. And note what it says here, devoid of the Spirit. Once again, these teachers are not saved. They may say they are, they may act like they are, but in what they are doing and their teaching and what's actually in their heart, they are not saved, they are not of Christ the Holy Spirit is not guiding them, nor is he in them. So then as we get to verse 20, we have to build ourselves up. Verses 20 through 23. Now, in verse 20, but you, beloved, once again, he's talking to the Christians, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Keep yourself from falling by reading the word, listening to the apostles' teachings, standing strong in the faith, praying, 
listening to the Holy Spirit as you pray, staying in right standing with God, following him, waiting on God and his mercy to carry you through, looking forward and anticipating the coming of Christ. Titus chapter 2 verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. As he continues into verse 22, he continues the encouragement here, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Jude encourages them to help their doubting brothers and sisters. Okay, He also encourages uh, them to help the doubting lost people who are struggling and may be right on the edge of falling for this false teaching. We have to be in prayer for others who are not uh, listening to the Spirit or right on the edge or are not saved yet and are trying to be led astray because there's nothing more satisfying probably uh, for Satan is to deceive one when they're right on the brink of being saved and understanding who Jesus truly is and what he has done for them. And he leads them astray for them to be following a false doctrine and therefore so much more difficult to actually hear and listen to the true gospel. He encourages them to be praying for them. Have mercy with fear, it says. We pray for them, but we don't want to get too close. We need to stay away from them enough and what they do so that we are not sucked into what they are following and fall for the false teaching as well and are dragged down with them. So the conclusion, as we come to verses 24 and 25, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. I love that first statement, okay? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Wow, now that's encouraging. Very encouraging. Jude has been talking this whole letter about all these bad guys and all the bad things that they're wanting to do and can and will do and how we have to watch out and not slip up and, and, and fall for the false teachings. And we have to be strong. We have to be careful. We have to hold fast to the faith. Don't be fooled. Don't be led astray. All of those things, etc., etc. But now to him, that capital H there, now to God, oh, how good it is to hear and read those words because he is able to keep you from stumbling and he is able to make you stand in his glory, blameless, face to face with Christ and with great joy. Now that's a beautiful benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. A difficult letter that Jude has to write because there are those false teachers that are in the early church trying to mess things up, trying to get in the way. And, and, and what a great way to do that because this is the early church. If, if Satan can get in there and mess things up from the very beginning, then that can mess things up for years and years and years, okay? And can dis destroy what Christ has done. And yet he can't do that because our God is greater than that. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. That is the relief that we can find. We are still going to have to do a battle, okay? 
We still have to fight the good fight. But God is there with us. We're not doing this alone. We have the strength of God working through us. So what do we do with it? We've heard what Jude has written uh, to the believers in the early church, which also applies to us today because it is here in our Bibles, and we know that it applies to us as well. What do we do with it? A few things here. We have to know there are false teachers all around us. You have, to, you have to come to the understanding that that is happening. There are false religions under the disguise of the name church and even have the name of Jesus in them. There are false teachers even with our, and in, within our own denomination. One example is that there are things that, that sometimes come up in the Baptist faith where we agree to disagree. Some of that is okay. but We have to be careful. Some of that is just plain heresy. We can't always just agree to disagree. There are some things that we cannot say that that's okay. There are some things, when it comes to the Word of God, we must stand strong on. We must stay true to the faith. We must stand strong on the teachings of the apostles. We must stand strong on the Word of God, the infallible Word of God, the inerrant Word of God, the every word is God-breathed Word of God. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> this is God's Word. All of it. And we must stand strong on that. We must stand strong when we are mocked because of our beliefs. We have to remember what God's word says about those who will lead others astray and away from him. We must share the truth with everyone with the love of Christ through his mercy so that they will know the one and only Savior of the world. It will be hard. It will be difficult. We will be mocked. We will be ridiculed, and we will be challenged on every side, every angle. But we will be able to do all of this and not stumble or fall. And we can stand before our God holy and blameless because our God is God and is able to keep us in his arms and in his care. And we are in his hands, and nothing or no one can snatch us out of his hands. He is God, and he deserves all the glory, honor, and praise. So let's live our lives for him in his way to give him that and to show him he is worthy. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time of studying tonight. I pray that you've been able to accomplish in and through me in this teaching what you desire. And through your word, we thank you for that, God. Lord, help us to stay true to you. Help us to stay true to your word. Keep us grounded in your word so that when these false teachers come our way, we can immediately see them because they are not following your word and be able to point them out and stay clear of them and even at times be able to help them to get out of their deceitful ways and into true faith in your son, Jesus. Lord, that's our prayer. Help us with that. And Lord, as we continue to strive to live our lives for you, forgive us when we fail you. But Lord, may each and every day, may we sin less and less as we become more and more like Jesus. We pray and ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining me tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the study in Jude we've done. Certainly not exhaustive, okay? There's a lot more in the book of Jude. You could dwell a lot more on that. But just going through it tonight, 
and, and seeing what is there. But I encourage you to go back and, and read some more and study some more in there. So uh, thank you again for, for being with me. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again soon and hope to see you on Sunday. God bless you.